Another thing you can do and you should do is pay attention to who they're having you speak to, right? There's a certain level of sensitivity or tone deafness <laughs> that a company might uh, manifest in terms of the discussions you're having. So I know of an individual, for example, she was contemplating uh, making a move uh, from one tech company to another tech company. I'll, I'll just say it like that, right? And in her experiences, and she's, you know, was uh, medium level, entry level executive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people she spoke to, not at one point in time, did she speak to a, a female developer or engineer or executive? Not one point in time, did she speak to uh, an engineer developer of color? Now, does that mean that they had none? Probably not. Uh, but it's certainly a level of tone deafness manifested if you are trying to bring this individual into your environment. So you may say, are you going there to do that? And, you know, at the end of the day, representation always matters because unless you're making a short pit stop, like in the pits where you come, you change tires and you move on. It, this is not, you know, I like to say, you know, the, the roles we have, it's not the same as... Uh, an athlete making a pit stop for a year and then transferring to another club. Right. That's not quite what it is. <laughs> okay. Your stops tend to be a bit longer. Okay. And the ability to continue and moving on, you know, putting myself aside. Yes. You highlighted this at the beginning, right? 19 years at IBM, but have had easily six or seven careers within those 19 years. So it's yes. almost as if I have moved across companies within a company. And so given that umbrella, think through uh, the people who they you know, introduce you to speak to, et cetera, et cetera. That matters. Uh, and if you're not doing that, if they are not doing that, you get a good sense of what the culture is like. Today, my guest, Dr. Nick Fuller, is the Vice President of the Distributed Cloud Organization at IBM Research. In this role, Nick leads a global team of over 150 research professionals and is responsible for providing AI and platform-based innovation for IBM's edge computing and application lifecycle management strategies. In his 18 plus years at IBM Research, Nick has held multiple technical, leadership, and client facing roles, working in partnership with various IBM product units and clients. Some key accomplishments during his time include delivering innovation for IBM's AI and IT initiative, and recently released products and services, including Watson AI Ops Application Modernization Accelerator with AI, Monitor Micro, and X-Force Red Vulnerable Risk Management. He's achieved over half a billion dollars in innovation-led savings for IBM's global technology services business spanning a three-year period, developing foundational capabilities for IBM Cloud, and delivering semiconductor innovation for five successive generations of CMOS devices for IBM systems business and OEM clients. Nick is an IBM master inventor, holding over 70 plus patents and has co-authored 75 technical publications and regularly provides commentary on AI and hybrid cloud integration for outlets such as IEEE Spectrum, Computer Weekly, and Caribbean Media. Nick obtained his Bachelor of Science in Physics and Math in 1997 from Morehouse College and his PhD in Applied Physics, yes, Applied Physics, in 2002 from Columbia University. He lives in Long Island, New York with his wife and two sons and in his spare time loves playing soccer, listening to music and writing. His memoir, Struggle and Progress, details his journey from youth to early adulthood in Barataria, Trinidad and Tobago with the absence of his biological father and exposure to crime in his community, and how the support from his mother and pivotal role models fueled a passion for science and discovery. I hope you're excited to listen to Dr. Fuller's career journey that led him to becoming a vice president at one of the top computing companies in the world. Let me go. <laughs> The show where we talk about data science in the Caribbean, highlighting practical ways that you can learn, get involved, and create your own impact using artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is the Caribbean Data Science Podcast with Mark Moyu and Jeff Sayon. All right, Nick, welcome to the show. Very grateful that you're, you're on and you're going to spend some time with us today. I know time is very valuable at, at your level, so looking forward to it. Same here, Mark. Great to be here with you. 
look forward to it as well. Great. So tell us where you're from in Trinidad or more specifically like the Caribbean region, you know, we represent the Caribbean and where you live currently and sort of what you're working on at the moment. Okay, sounds good. So I was born and raised in Barataria, Trinidad and Tobago. So Barataria is uh, northeast Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, strictly speaking, if you look at a map of Trinidad, it's obviously not west. But, <laughs> you know, the point of geographical reference is the infamous lighthouse. So mm. grew up there and uh, from Trinidad, from Barataria, after completing high school at Fatima uh, College, uh, moved to the U.S., for bachelor's, master's, PhD, and I know we'll get into that as well. So spent some time in Atlanta, spent some time in New York, have strong uh, other Caribbean linkage. My wife is Jamaican from Kingston. I've been to Jamaica several times. Uh, and in terms of what I'm working on, so my, my trajectory into uh, data science, AI, ML uh, is unique, but not so unique. <laughs> In, in the sense that uh, my PhD, my degrees aren't in computer science. My degrees are in physics, math, PhD in applied physics. I specialized in building microprocessors at Columbia. I spent some time doing programming as part of that PhD program in C, C++, uh, building you know, programmatic models for data analysis, data computation with a variety of subroutines, et cetera. Never built production code, but once I joined IBM and I spent many years building microprocessors for IBM clients, OEM clients and IBM systems, power systems, IBM mainframes. I, you know, the, the presence in the industry, uh, overall information technology with the growth of data as data continued to grow and with the emergence of cloud as traditional IT began to be complemented and ultimately displaced in some cases with cloud, uh, made that uh, transition. And that's close to 10 years at this point. So today, I, you know, fairly recently uh, in a new role, lead a global team of 150 researchers or so, and we're focused on two things. We're focused on the automation uh, of applications, application lifecycle management in terms of their movement to hybrid multi-cloud architectures and application availability once they're in those environments, application security, application compliance. And it turns out that overall journey for traditional enterprises in particular uh, is heavily influenced and can be simplified with AI, AI ML. So this is AI ML applied to the software stack, not in terms of human language. We've spent a ton of time at IBM doing this and over the last six or seven years myself, looking at how this can be uh, exploited. So that's one part of the portfolio and the recent addition to that portfolio is in edge computing. Uh, Edge is growing, uh, no, no secret to anyone listening to this podcast, and uh, we are doubling down in terms of the investment we're making as far as edge computing is concerned. So yeah, that's that's my day job, uh, and that's the new day job as of a month or so ago, and very excited about it. Great, and I, you know, you have a very, very uh, important role in, in the future of kind of what things are going to look like, especially at the edge. And I think for many folks at home or, or just in general, thinking about how hard it is for a large company to migrate their infrastructure to the cloud. I, I, there are many things that I don't even um, sort of consider, uh, especially when you start talking about security later on, right? Uh, so you've been at IBM for, I, I looked on LinkedIn, it's, it's 19 years, right? And you know there are many different thoughts that come to mind when I think about that in terms of, People say, oh, you shouldn't stay at a company for a long time and blah, blah, blah. But it, it, it seems like you've you've definitely made a great career there. So why have you chosen to make a career at IBM? And, and more specifically, can you uh, re-highlight the importance of IBM sort of in the world? I, I think if folks did not grow up in the in the early computing era, they, they really wouldn't appreciate the role that IBM played uh, throughout. Yeah, so, so this typically goes one of two ways. When I meet uh, many millennials at uh, recruiting events, what have you, and we have many millennials as well in my own organization, mm -hmm. just to be clear, right? Uh, but when they get comfortable with me, my own cousin, right, <laughs> who just finished his PhD in the UK, right? Uh, he himself, when he got comfortable, because we, we are second cousins and, you know, we had heard about each other, but it took some time for us to get fully acquainted. And th that question invariably comes up because IBM is going through that, that transformation. If I look at the last three quarters, 
led by our current CEO, Avin Krishna, we, we've recorded uh, growth in our earnings and our stock price has, Wall Street has responded with we see adjustments in the stock price in a positive direction and so on. Market cap rising, which is the things that IBMers of old would have been familiar with. Mm-hmm. So in terms of, you know, the, the, the question of, of why, you know, if you look at the career I've had, I started off by saying I built microprocessors. I did that for the better part of 10 years as a physicist, as a material scientist, working on next generation devices. So in terms of device technology, I joined when device technology was uh, heating up in terms of materials and new materials being introduced into what was then known as deep submicron. Right. When you contrast that with the two nanometer announcement that we just made, uh, which in part facilitated this new Intel partnership, uh, mm-hmm. it, it pales in comparison because back then you were looking at 130 nanometer node, 90 nanometer node. Okay. But IBM was on the forefront then and continues to be, though no longer in manufacturing from a device fabrication point of view. And it became a no brainer for me, though I interviewed at many other places. Now, I hadn't had the foresight necessarily, even though I joined because of IBM's vertical integration that I would have necessarily be doing what I'm doing today. I, that would be a lie, <laughs> right? So <laughs> after spending, you know, the better part of six or seven or so years uh, working on everything facilita- facilitated and associated with what it means to build next-gen devices, you know, like any good scientist technologist, I was observing what was happening around us, with both within the company and outside of the company. And as I mentioned before, tremendous growth in data. We were seeing that in many uh venues, many avenues, uh, and then, of course, the emergence of cloud at around 2006. And though not having a PhD in computer science, you know, a PhD really means you have the ability to learn new areas. And this is one mm-hmm. of the things I tell people who I recruit, right? I have many people who work at, in my department, their PhDs are in different areas. They may have started in distributed systems, but they're doing AI and software engineering as an example. And, and that whole notion of how you manage and evolve your career is something that one has to pay constant attention to. There are people who have specialized in a specific thing and they stay in that specific thing, of course, for the entire career. And I, by the way, could have done the same thing, even within IBM and certainly outside of IBM if I had chosen to do so. But for me, what was interesting was more where uh, industry was going, you know, both uh, quote unquote SaaS enterprises, the Uber Airbnbs of the world, the Netflixes of the world. But in addition, what traditional enterprises had to do. It was very exciting to me to see what you could do with data insights as you generate data from an enterprise point of view to help you with future lines of business, growth, uh, customer sat, and so on and so forth. And so I started you know, doing like what many physicists actually within IBM have done. Interestingly enough, a couple of my mentors have a similar trajectory. And for the most part, the people in leadership positions don't necessarily have that same background, but many of us actually, interestingly enough, do. So that's why I said we're perhaps a majority within a minority. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, uh, coming back to the fundamental question that you asked about managing your career, I think, you know, yes, there's a certain level of depth you need to have going into any field, whether you be a data scientist, uh, you know, a developer, um, machine learning expert, and whatever area of, of AI you might be specializing in cloud, and so on and so forth. Thereafter, after delivering value, I think it's important to understand what does your career mean to you? This, this to me is even more fundamental than you know the area you specialize in. It comes back to what you're passionate about, right? Uh, what's your purpose, if you have identified that. And if you have those two Ps identified, then the next P is about perspiring, right? Driving really aggressively and pursuing that passion and defining that purpose aggressively. So for me, you know, interestingly, having done PhD in physics, having made major contributions to IBM technology roadmap for devices for five successive generations, I was at a juncture and that juncture was propelling me into where industry was going, the emergence of data, the growth of cloud, the emergence of cloud, And though IBM responded a bit after others like Amazon and Microsoft, uh, there was a perfect opportunity for me to segue, you know, given that I had delivered value before, it was certainly seen as an individual who can deliver value elsewhere. Okay, that's, there's a lot to unpack in that. (laughs) And and I think it's very important for folks listening, especially from high school, college, and, and the burning question, I think, in anyone's mind when they think about data science is like PhD or not. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely come to that juncture. So we do the show to encourage people 
from home uh, and in the diaspora to pursue uh, data-driven careers, right? So can you share with us your view on how do you see machine learning, AI, and especially the cloud sort of playing an impact in the Caribbean's future? Yeah, so completely ubiquitous, right? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because I, I have uh, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old. My my ten-year-old is very analytical, and I had him in a robotics course uh, pre-pandemic last year. It wasn't feasible, and this year I put him in another programming course along with his brother for the first time. His brother, like perhaps any uh, you know young child, uh, is is enamored with uh, you know the potential of video games. Of course, I manage screen time very aggressively. <laughs> but mm -hmm. having said that, uh, you know I sort of tease out of them. You know what's the significance of this, right? How do you think this is working? Why do you think it's working? Do you want to understand what's behind these characters that you are able to manipulate on your screen? And so we're in an age where computer science is completely ubiquitous, irrespective of your background. It applies to chemical companies. It applies to agricultural companies. And typically at the application inside level, which is typically how many uh, both small, medium, and large businesses enter into that AI transformation. Companies that are not necessarily digital by design. Of course, companies that are digital by design, that's an inherent part of their overall fabric. Uh, so when I think of the region, right, uh, as you go across the various uh, sectors, whether that be finance, whether that be agriculture, whether that be aviation, right, uh, it doesn't really matter. There's the opportunity for small, medium and large business, starting at the business insight level of leveraging the intelligence you can get from building models to understand customer behavior and so on, to ultimately do what? Help grow your business, help uh, improve uh, the relationship between clients, uh, help uncover uh, various uh, unknowns that you might not have discovered had you not dug more deeply into the data and built a model and you know ultimately uh, observe how that model evolved as you pass data through it. So there's that uh, notion for sure uh, as it relates to individuals coming out of school, irrespective, in my view, of your degree concentration and focus. I see this being completely critical uh, again, at the business inside level across those industries. But then if you peel that back a bit, similar to the, uh, the, the uh, UE lecture I gave a few weeks back, from a traditional enterprise point of view, much like uh, Cal has already initiated and others are in uh, pursuing a similar strategy, it's critical for those enterprises to adopt a hybrid uh, uh, deployments uh, for, if not anything else, eliminating technical debt. Many of these enterprises possess dated software stacks and the management of that software stack creates uh, an investment that's unnecessary given if your core business is banking, your core business is aviation, telecommunications, what have you. And so the, clearly, of course, there are other uh, reasons for keeping you know, uh, applications in house, right? Be it proprietary, be it uh, regulatory, what have you. But certainly not all applications need to remain there. And so the whole notion of getting these traditional enterprises to have a more digital footprint, much in the way, again, of Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, and the like, allows them to do what? At the business level now, with uh, workloads that are running on hybrid architectures, given that you now can get into uh, you know, more agile process development, more agile application development, generate the insights they need. So you know, coming back to the fundamental question you asked, the region, of course, is like you said, the focus of one of the reasons, certainly a heavy reason why we're putting this together. To me, this is completely ubiquitous, irrespective of where you are. And given the industries that we have, if you're a young hotshot coming out of UE, if you're a young hotshot coming out of UTT, if you're coming out of high school, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. with Coursera courses, with the, you know, uh, machine learning courses online, you are able to supplement what you have learned. And you might have a fantastic idea and you don't need to wait. That's the, to me, the beauty of this economy, which has emerged as a result of technology, both cloud and, and the revolution in AI. Great. And, and I think one of the things I think a lot about for folks at home or, or just folks in general, you know, your background is in physics and math, right? And, and I think there's this stigma about, hey, for me to enter into this field, I need to have that depth of knowledge or, or that amount of fundamentals. And to some degree, the, in, in different roles, right, there, there is that pure requirement that you are at that level. 
However, there's so much in the tech ecosystem, uh, especially now as you start talking about the hybrid cloud ecosystem and then the edge computing ecosystem where uh, there are many different roles that you, you don't have to be as crazy technical. And, and I think one of the things we love to highlight in the podcast is, you know, you're from the Caribbean, you can speak to many different types of people. Um, so can you maybe give a piece of advice for folks who didn't have a physics and math background and, and what they should start to think about as their role in the new uh, computing economy? Yeah, you know, this is a, an important point to touch on because uh, our culture, and, and by our culture, I'm going to broaden that beyond TNT to the English-speaking Caribbean and perhaps even broader to all of the Caribbean. Uh, clearly, there's a heavy focus on academic excellence. And that's great, first and foremost, right? Uh, the likes of you, myself, and many others would not have been able to uh, achieve the level of success we have achieved had we not have some level of academic excellence. So I certainly subscribe to academic excellence, to be clear. But coming back to the fundamental uh, part of the question that you're asking, you don't have to be uh, that particular specialist if you want to be in the space, right? Because the space offers many opportunities. Uh, you Obviously, if you wanted to be the architect for a particular application that you're thinking of that can heavily disrupt some industry, much like Uber, Lyft did, much like Airbnb did, and so on, I keep coming back to those because they're quite relevant, then if you want to be that architect, clearly you need to have that depth. Having said that, if you have a good sense of uh, market dynamics, right, and this is an interesting, that, interesting thing that I discovered about myself. Uh, again, you know, that this was not what I was doing. I, I took maybe a, a microeconomics course uh, at, at Mohawk College when I did my bachelor's degree, and, and that was it, right? Uh, while many others were pursuing uh, heavy degrees in economics and finance. But one of the things I discovered as I was going through the process of uh, making my transition and, quite frankly, uh, maturing in the space as a scientist at IBM Research was a keen awareness of where the market's taking you. And this is typically something anyone working in an industrial lab uh, certainly grows into. And there's a sense of, okay, understanding the market and what particular technology problem can fit the market. That technology problem can also be early. We've seen that before as well. You might be a fast follower and you can be successful, or you might end up being uh, too late of an entrant. Okay, so this is an interesting dynamic because with the emergence of how ubiquitous uh, CS, computer science, and cloud and AI are today, uh, it's important that folks understand, yes, if you, if you like that passion, and maybe you didn't start there as, you know, coming back to the question that you asked, certainly if you want to be that architect, sure, you got to get deeper, okay, and, and make sure you possess those skills. But if you want to play in the space, you certainly need to understand what is happening at a particular level, but then by working with the right people, working with the architects, et cetera, you can find your niche as well. Yeah, I appreciate you sort of highlighting sort of the breadth of things that folks can enter. Uh, you mentioned stuff about your kids, right? And, and how you are sort of guiding them to think a little more deeply about how does this new technological uh, world work? And I think many people who may be listening may have kids at, at different ages, uh, some young, some in their teenage years, what advice would you give to them? I think, you know, I just spoke to someone recently and, and their child was sort of, especially like a single mother. Um, what, what should folks be listening out for? Because and to some degree, you're a little biased in terms of like you are deep in the industry so you can actually sort of project and, and give advice that will, will project a lot longer. But for folks who may not have that background, what are things that they should look out for? And, and one thing that means a lot for me is um, as a parent, if your background is not in that, definitely not limiting the child's outlook on what is possible. Yeah, this is an important question, right? And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll you know give you a quick joke as I answer the question. I was mentioning to one of my colleagues, his daughter is 15. And uh, his daughter has done a number of uh, Python uh, summer camps and so on. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's adamant she, she has to be uh, a developer. She, she has mm. to be an architect, right? Right. I said, suppose she's the next Mozart. Suppose she's the next, you know, uh, other expert outside of computer science. He's like, no, she's, <laughs> this is what she will do. And 
I think, you know, I, I sort of retain a different perspective and, and my perspective is the following, right? I, I think exposure is critical. Uh, you know, uh, my mother, you know, didn't complete uh, beyond a high school education, but had keen business insight uh, in part from her political affiliations and part from running different businesses. And so was very successful doing so in raising uh, two children on her own. My, my sister's a nurse uh, and you, you've heard my background. So, mm-hmm. Ultimately, I think exposure is critical when I look back on, on what she was able to facil- facilitate. Again, you know, we're being raised in that island culture that we discussed before, where academic excellence is demanded. Certainly, I was a product of that. And I continue to, you know, echo that for, for my kids, right? And they see that quite candidly today. But they also know, you know, my wife's a dentist and, and, and we don't push our kids to say, you know, okay, so you have to be a dentist or a scientist technologist. That is not what we're saying, but you certainly have to understand the significance and importance. Now, coming back to the other side of what you asked, if you if you don't have that background, I think it's virtually uh, impossible to not see the value, particularly in this pandemic, uh, that technology uh, plays and provides, you know, and, and this is one of the things I, I try to communicate when I do some of these sessions, you know, using Zoom, Zoom has 300 million, runs 300 million sessions a day. And to me, that's always mind boggling. When you combine that now with WebEx, uh, Skype and others, right? You're probably approaching a billion or so running on cloud infrastructure with a certain level of elasticity, resiliency. Uh, We haven't had, knock on wood, any issues in terms of our communication just yet. And we're Mm -hmm. talking about video together with audio. So if, that alone doesn't uh, allow you to develop an appreciation for you know the significance of technology in terms of mere communication of course there's much more than that from credit card transactions to everything being heavily interconnected and driven by technology as a person sitting outside of it observing the world again this comes back to another key point namely of having a growth mindset right if you don't have a growth mindset you're probably not listening to this podcast but if you do have a growth mindset and you're listening to this podcast the idea is you know pay attention to what's around you uh make sure you provide those opportunities through schooling and otherwise uh for your kids because it's impossible certainly by the time they reach your age and my age for them to ignore technology and certainly well before yeah and I think it's quite important, especially as parents. One thing that was very sort of clear to me is I think back in the Caribbean region, you could have maybe not gone to school or may not have had certain skill sets, but you could have still found your way in the marketplace, right? And, and build a good life and you know be successful and, and whatnot. And I think today it, it's very, very different, right? The cost of things, the the opportunities that exist, I would say, are much more competitive. So you definitely need to separate yourself in the marketplace and setting up your kids for success. You know, if you want them to to have a, not a stress-free life, but, you know, a life where they can thrive, I think it's very important that they, that you guide them in, in something in tech. And, and I think as, as you're saying it, it doesn't have to be, but at least once they're exposed, they can now navigate their way through that new world, you know? Precisely. The, their passion may lie within tech and not necessarily as a developer architect. Maybe, you know, they get into the whole business context. Maybe they develop, they develop their own uh, business, right? They, they create a startup that thrives, right? Maybe they join a larger corporation and become an offering manager for a product line. It, it can vary. But the, the key thing is potentially uncovering, unlocking a passion that they may have that otherwise you would not have known. Yeah. And, and so you mentioned passion a lot. and. One thing that I've kind of learned uh, as as people learn about your career journey, you did math for the math, physics, and chemistry in high school, right? So let, let's kind of pause there and kind of tell us maybe why you, you chose those subjects. Yeah, no, this this actually goes back to a couple of things. It's definitely in part maternally influenced, okay. right? In terms of, again, that culture of academic excellence, et cetera. But you may say, okay, academic excellence can span multiple things. Why science, right? Uh, there was certainly a push, right? From her point of view in that direction, mm-hmm. perhaps in, in her own way, perceiving that that's more critical, maybe, right? As far as the future is concerned. But the other thing that started to happen fairly naturally was as, you know, like the typical kid, as I would get toys and so on, I would take them apart. You hear this story all the time, but it's true. I I really wanted to understand, well, how does this thing really work? Invariably, I never put them back together, right? But that was part of the discovery process. 
And then back then, CNN ran a program uh, weekly known as Science and Technology Week. Uh, and uh, I would watch that vigorously, right? Quite attentively. Yes. And I covered a variety of things uh, back then. So all of that really, you know, in the beginning, I thought, yeah, I, I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, you know, my my adopted uh, grandmother, I mean, she rest in peace. You know, I, I remember uh, right before she passed, she remember, you know, saying, you remember when you wanted to be a pilot? Obviously that evolved to, to medicine and, you know, you discover what you really like. Science is just one thing for you when you're a kid. And as you get deeper into science, you realize what it entails, right? Now, back then, CS was relatively immature. We're talking about things like Fortran and so on, <laughs> right? It goes way back. So I didn't think I should do it at A-levels. By the time I got to college, spent some time, did a few courses. And of course, at, at my PhD, did a few courses as well, but deeply into physics at that point in time and, and saw myself, you know, continuing in that direction because of, again, what was pulling things then? It was the growth of IT and the growth of IT mm -hmm. back then was driven by scaling, right? Transistor scaling heavily. And so I gravitated towards that, uh, you know, applied to a number of places. IBM, when I joined, had just done the first microprocessor that was enabled by copper interconnects, which significantly reduced the latency in comparison to aluminum interconnects. Uh, others eventually followed suit, but IBM led the way in that regard. So it was a no-brainer by the time I joined. And I also joined in part because I saw the vertical integration and I figured I would evolve. Never thought it would be what, what's happening today, but I sort of foresaw, I, given that I get fairly bored quickly I, I you know i said okay this is good I, I like where they are they're leading maybe i'll have the opportunity to evolve I, and i love new york so hey perfect <laughs> game time yeah game <laughs> time yep yep great and one thing i wanted to dive into was physics and i've spent you know so much time with folks who have gone deep into physics and i think uh, you all see the world and I'm, you know, definitely classifying you as a, as a physicist, right? I would not classify myself as a physicist in terms of there's a deep appreciation for how things work, I think, in the world. And, and there's a certain amount of what I would call calculated optimism, in addition to calculated pessimism uh, as well. <laughs> it, could, it could swing wildly uh, in both ways. Um, can you share with us the, the value of maybe folks studying physics, I think, as I've gone deep into math? I've, I've had a, a much deeper appreciation and respect for that topic. Yeah, so, you know, a physicist would say that's clairvoyant. Someone outside of the field might say something else. Uh, I fully agree with you. You know, studying physics uh, ultimately gets you to be quite philosoph philosophical as well. Mm. I don't know of a single physicist, whether they have remained, you know, core at, in academia, national labs, in the industry, or they have evolved like I have, uh, who don't have a, a similar sort of philosophical appreciation, the calculated optimism and pessimism that you speak about. This is true because you, you really have to get to a level of precision. And I can tell you when I, I first transitioned fully, right, even though I had some uh, computing background, when I first transitioned fully, a, a number of things annoyed me. Uh, the use of platform uh, across the board. Everything's a platform, right? <laughs> and because there was a certain level of precision that I was accustomed to, uh, it, it, drew, it drove me uh, significantly crazy. And my colleagues at work will tell you that. And perhaps I do the same thing now. Uh, you know, so there's an appreciation for sure, right? Uh, do you have to have a, a, a physics background at, say, O-level uh, or furthermore, at A level, I wouldn't argue that you need to. I think if you're passionate about understanding why, right, which is what physicists continually ask, uh, and as you ask why, <laughs> you invariably go deeper and deeper and deeper into the building blocks of everything, right? And th this is what physicists tend to do, which is ultimately why I ended up there as opposed to something that was an amalgamation of those building blocks, right? Which is where I am now. <laughs> But that perspective is, is an interesting one. And, and I would argue when you have that background and you get to the level where you're looking full stack, right, which is where I play now, uh, there's a deeper appreciation that you, you seek in terms of understanding how well things connect, 
right? Why, you know, you might be able to get some acceleration, for example, based on fundamental infrastructure elements, why it might be beneficial to running a machine learning model, especially when you think about edge computing in one location versus another, and a variety of other constraints. These constraints exist across the board, right? Uh, so the, the one thing I want to be careful about, though, if you're in, if you're listening to this and you're in high school and you have your O-level subjects already chosen, and physics is not part of that, that's okay. <laughs> that just means it wasn't something you wanted to do. And that's that's perfectly fine. Likewise, if you're an A-level and you haven't chosen that, it's a question of whether you're passionate there. I think the bigger challenge, quite frankly, and I'll flip the question a little bit, if you're a core physicist, one of the things you could struggle with, given where society is evolving, where technology is evolving, right? As a core physicist, the opportunities to land roles that are core and not applied, those are increasingly difficult. And so you may end up, you know, invariably many people think, okay, I have to end up in academia, right? That's certainly an option, but not the only option. You may end up at a national lab, right? And of course, the, those are quite uh, prevalent across the US and parts of Europe and so on and so forth. But if there's a notion within you of, uh, you know, looking at applied areas, right? Quantum computing is growing and, and the ability to understand those device geometries as you deal with error correction and the challenges in, qu in quantum. Uh, physics background certainly is beneficial there. But interestingly, the blend of a physics background and a computer science background turns out to be quite beneficial there too. So, you know, it, it's interesting because and I'll, I'll sum up by saying the following. The interdisciplinary nature of work today ultimately means you will be touching different pieces. So. That doesn't mean you become a generalist from high school, right? That's impossible. You can't be, right? Uh, but ultimately getting to a level where you can have an appreciation for what it means to be interdisciplinary, I view as key. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you sort of expanding on that because I think what I've gained a, an appreciation of in physics, you know, I did physics in high school, but I didn't really understand. I, I didn't necessarily resonate with the subject as a physicist to ask the deeper questions. And the reason why I brought up this topic is because uh, you mentioned that word precision. And, and I think the, the lesson to take away for folks who maybe have not studied physics or will never study physics in their life is uh, this notion of first principles. And, and that uh, I'm at NVIDIA now and, and the CEO Jensen is all about first principles. And, you know, like Elon Musk ascribes to that as well. And, and there's this very clear view of how things work, it's very sort of unbiased and it's just very objective as to what needs to be done and uh, and sort of the elements that that sort of lead to whatever success you're going for. So I think if you can adopt a physicist mindset such that, hey, there's a certain level of precision I need to get to, I think another interesting thing that you mentioned, like getting annoyed, uh, physicists do tend to get very annoyed at, at things that are not precise and that drives them to get other things done, which is great, right? Uh, which is a, a, a pretty useful trait to just move fast, I, I would say, right? Um, yeah, no, I agree. You know, but as you say this, this something else popped into my head and I want to share really quickly. Uh, in my time, the last 10 years or so in, in computer science and across, you know, the, the full stack and, and different capabilities and, and domains within CS, one thing has, has emerged and I, I think it probably holds true. People who are experts in programming languages, they tend to think, think the same way, actually. And, and it's, it's interesting because the more I interact with programming language experts, right, uh, in my team and overall within research and other parts of IBM, I see those traits. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm coming back to the question you asked, right? I, I fully agree. You know, there's a certain level. If you're pursuing any type of career, you... It's not a fly-by-night thing to use a, a, a local expression, right? It is governed by a certain set of core principles, right? And the more you can understand those as you respond to your passion that comes up again, right? The more you will find joy in pursuing that purpose that you have identified. Now, if you made a miscalculation, that's okay too. Pivot. That's what agility is all about. It doesn't only apply in application building. It applies in your life. Now, obviously, clearly the risk reward you have to think through when you talk about pivoting, right? But, you know, coming back to that point, I did want to bring that up because if, if you like, as you explore uh, programming languages and understand what it means, uh, 
as languages evolve and, and you use languages to build. Uh, this is an interesting concept that seems to be emerging as well. People within CS refer to programming languages experts as the physicists of CS. I've heard that expression as well. Yeah, and they're very like super rigorous. And um, yeah, I think adopting a level of rigor in, in anything that you do, I think will will always pay off. So I wanted to hop, in, hop into your college experience, right? Uh, what was your mindset like in, in high school, by the way, in terms of, you know, I need, I need to get out there. I'm sure mom was, you know, cracking whips on you, especially you probably, you know, just have a ton of energy and, and don't know really what to do with it. Um, so tell us about that. What was your yeah. mindset like? And, and I think that's really important, especially at your level. Agreed. She was cracking multiple whips. I agree on, on my sister and myself. And it was a no-brainer at that point, you know, as I was matriculating through uh, sixth form that I would apply to university. What was uncertain was would I get, you know, financial assistance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I was pretty clear that I was going to pursue some physics, electrical engineering, uh, math type of combination, right? Uh, so I applied to a number of places, uh, the Ivy League institutions and non-Ivy League institutions, and, and various uh, offers came through. And in the end, I took uh, the offer from Morehouse where uh, there were other uh, Fatima, uh, ex-Fatima students, Fatima okay. alumni who were there, uh, many of whom I'm still in touch with, still close friends mm -hmm. with. And, and they spoke highly, right? Uh, back then, you know, that was 1993, the uh, reputation of Morehouse wasn't perhaps as well known perhaps as it is now. Uh, and we tend to have this mindset that your bachelor's degree has to be at this Ivy League institution. That certainly was the environment in which I was raised. Uh, and so what these guys did, they really helped me to understand, uh, you know, not only the history of the school and other schools that I should potentially apply to, the camaraderie, you know, you're not thinking about the emotional, mental uh, challenges that you will undergo invariably when you leave home, right? You're right. thinking about going to be pursuing this degree, I'm excited, this is what I'm good at, this is what I'm passionate about, uh, but you're not coupling these other factors. So my eventual roommate also came from Fatima, uh, and we room together close friends today and uh, best friends today. And uh, that helped both of us. And then, of course, the uh, upperclassmen who were from uh, Trinidad and Tobago as well and, and a variety of different schools. So, so the experience was great in part because of the legacy those guys had set. If you stepped onto campus and folks who you were from Trinidad and Tobago, they assumed you were bright. Yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting, right? Oh, you must be smart. You're from Trinidad and Tobago. That, that was the all easily the first thing that was said, you know, during freshman year upon meeting people. Um, physics, not, not as well known for because it's a small liberal arts school, right? Probably better known, actually, not only from a civil rights point of view in terms of people like MLK, et cetera, but the finance program had always been strong. Many graduates went on to Wall Street, et cetera. So I would argue, you know, from a fame point of view, that's what the school was known for. But very strong engineering program with dual degree programs with Georgia Tech, University of Michigan, and the core uh, STEM disciplines from math, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, biology, very strong departments, a lot of external funding. And it was great because the rigor was the same. You know, I had a, a professor who has since retired from uh, Guyana and he drove a, a level of rigor in us, <laughs> right? Dr. Moore, I remember him vividly. Saw him recently, we presented him with an award, a plaque to commemorate, you know, his service upon his retirement. Uh, the chair at that time uh, was Dr. Dixon uh, and, you know, American uh, professor, but similar level of rigor. <laughs> you know, uh, there were many uh, West African professors from Nigeria. So, you know, irrespective of where these guys were from and where they did their degrees, the one constant there was similar to what we had experienced, uh, you know, growing up uh, and pursuing A levels in TNT, namely a certain level of rigor, right? And the new thing, though, just to be clear, right? So obviously that's what we were accustomed to. The new thing was uh, make sure you get out there and you use your summers wisely to land opportunities, to land internships, right? And so that was drilled into us from very early. So uh, I spent my first summer actually at University of Washington, uh, Seattle, 
uh, working on mass spectrometry of proteins, <laughs> right? So the only <laughs> physics part there is, you know, mass spec machines in terms of separation particles based on their charge to mass ratios, uh, but the application of it, and you could argue it opened up, uh, you know, uh, or turned on a light bulb in my head because how you use, uh, you know, physics principles and physics tools in an applied setting is really what that was all about. So understanding the significance of protein to synthesis and the like, that's, you know, apart from being in the Pacific Northwest, which was a fantastic experience in the summer, right, as opposed to outside of the summer. And, and this continued, right? We were encouraged with uh, the chair of physics, chair of math as well, to uh, ensure you gain practical experiences so that you figure out what your job would look like. Because unless you're you know, going to teach, so to speak, high school, uh, college, what have you, uh, your job will be different from what you're experiencing in the class. And that was very valuable because uh, not only myself, but many others did that. You know, one of the upperclassmen, for example, who was a strong mentor, I'll actually highlight two of them. One went on to work for uh, a variety of oil companies and, and is, is uh, home now uh, in, a, in a major position in uh, the oil industry. Another uh, worked for uh, Corning, right? And, uh, you know, is doing fantastic stuff in photovoltaics in, in the DC area. So you, you see this notion of how, I mean, these are all physics background individuals and some have PhDs in, in physics as well. They all ended up in various applied settings, my, myself, of course, in, in heavy CS domain and in the intersection of AI and cloud. So, you know, to summarize the question you asked, you know, I would say there were two critical things I would want to highlight from a college point of view and in selecting the school. The school obviously needs to be good at what you want to major in. There's no debate about that. Uh, a support network is critical for anything, yeah, not only undergrad, but, you know, grad and beyond, right? Those are absolutely critical things. And so uh, selecting a school where, you know, you have some level of support, that's, that should be, you know, top of your mind. And secondly, given the nature of the world today in terms of uh, how figuring out what it is you do, you know, by all means, seek internship opportunities. I'll end by saying on my recruiting trips, I, I meet a ton of students. There was a student who I interviewed. We eventually made an offer for, to her for a summer internship. She had internship experiences. She was from the Bay Area. She had internship experiences at high school level at the likes of LinkedIn and other major companies. And that's not unheard of. But that's the type of competition that you're facing today, right, when it comes to seeking and landing opportunities to grow. Yeah, getting into chips, I think I have the, the inverse story, if we go into parallel universes, right, where I got my first internship in my last year of my PhD, Right, whereas you got yours in the first, in like in your first year of your bachelor's. So, um, and, and I definitely, I think throughout my entire academic career, that was always burning in my mind. And 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 it's I wouldn't say it's for lack of effort, right? I think it's it's a function of network who you're exposed to. Um, in addition to your degree, like I did chemical engineering, you did physics and math, and and one of the things I think when you choose a particular degree. I don't want to say people judge you, but people project from that degree what you can do. So for instance, if you're a chemical engineer, oh, I want you to do marketing. Okay, like you, you know nothing there, but uh, maybe physics and math. Oh, you could probably pick up CS. You could probably pick up other things. So these, these fundamental degrees end up shaping the perception that you are presented with or how you're perceived by other hiring managers, let's say, like, oh, this guy, he can, he can do this, he can do that, because he had to do all these different things. So I think um, even if you don't have internships, maybe just trying to, a lot of my successes come from volunteering, actually, and, and hustling like crazy, um, which coming back to something that you mentioned in, in your statements is that network, right, of especially folks who've gone beyond you from the crib, and it, it seemed that ha to have a, a great impact on, on your overall outlook and, and guidance in, in school. So can you maybe rescore the importance of having that network, especially early on? Yeah, and I want to uh, circle back as well on what you said in terms of uh, uh, the perception of what you can do based on, on your degrees. First of all, you know, never, never, never let anyone tell you what you can or cannot do. Uh, and that, that's a message for the listeners. And uh, I think it's interesting because if you're pursuing uh, the quote-unquote traditional route of joining an enterprise, a company, a tech provider, right? 
inspect the culture of that tech provider. Interestingly, right, the culture within IBM is very one, very much one of people can do different things. Okay, mm-hmm. because you have many past individuals who have different types of backgrounds who have rose to successful executive type roles. Lou Glissner, who transformed IBM uh, many years ago, was running Potato Chips Company before he took over the no job way. as CEO and transformed IBM. And wow. so that openness to anyone being able to pick up, you know, at the right level, of course, it would take time for me to become a programming languages expert, but I don't need to be. I have them around me. And together with the other experts, I can shape and drive a strategy and execute accordingly. So I really want to highlight that because if a culture within an enterprise, within a startup, within a major company is such that there are inhibitors to you progressing, it's probably not the right place because it would become difficult if you want to evolve to evolve. But then you know, back to the specific question that you asked, it's absolutely critical uh, to grow your network. Now, I have a perhaps different perspective on how you do that. Uh, in the age of, you know, API transactions, there's the notion of instantaneous uh, networking, you know, uh, speed networking. I personally find that challenging. And, and here's where I'm coming from. If a network with an individual, he or she is built through a more organic means and there's a natural connection, I believe you will derive a whole lot more from that. Now, that, I'm not saying that every network needs to be of that nature, right? In some cases, it's simply you know one person putting you in touch with another so that you have a sponsor in a job that you apply for, as an example, or a sponsor from a VC point of view to help get your project off the ground. All of those are useful. General rule of thumb, though, I would recommend avoid the notion of API based networking. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Make, make your networks uh, rich, organic, and I think you would derive so much more from such networks. Yeah, I appreciate you calling out organic networks because um, I have a fundamental rule on LinkedIn uh, for anyone I ever talk to. Don't ever connect with someone, um, especially if you're a student uh, early in your career. Do not connect with. Is, you know, if, I'm, if I wanted to connect with you, I would have never reached out on LinkedIn and connected. I would have followed you. I would have gone and watched all the posts that you post. And I would have probably courted you for about two or three months uh, in terms of, you know, sharing your content, helping you to build your brand and earning that connection. And I think um, what I end up seeing in, in some people is, oh, why would you connect with me? And, um, you know, we're from the same place and whatnot. And I think People don't really respect or understand, especially at your level, the the amount of things that you have coming at you, the level at which you have to sort of operate and the things that you're responsible for and how much you are trying to squeeze out of a unit uh, per unit of time to, you know, just take 30 minutes to talk to someone that you're going to repeat the same conversation to, I don't know, 10,000 people, you'll, you'll never get anything done. So I think, um, you know, reaching out to folks like like yourself, you know, coming with a, a very specific focus and essentially being okay with earning it. I, I think that's that's one thing that maybe some folks need to get comfortable with in terms of, it's not because we're from Trinidad, yeah, like we can, I can talk and like you have a whole multi-billion dollar business to, to run. Otherwise, you know, you won't have a job, right? <laughs> you know, it's interesting to, to hear you put it the way you did because i don't know that i have met a lot of uh folk who think it through that way right and there's value in thinking it through the way you've done because uh, you know obviously i get the whole notion of yes uh, xyz may be able to assist because of what have you i i get that right uh but if you pursue the relationship with only that in mind it's, it's not from a position of the whole notion that we are putting together here, right? We, we are putting together, you are putting together, you are leading this initiative, yes, to inspire other individuals coming up who can see success stories, get advice on how to be successful in data, AI, ML, cloud, what have you. Fantastic. But there's a role they play as well in the individuals who come potentially after them, potentially adjacent to them. And so if they are intrinsically not fun- fundamentally getting what you're saying in terms of how you approach uh, networking, it means that there is no continued passage, no continued hmm. And that's really what we're after, right? It's, it doesn't stop 
with the first group that are positively influenced through the podcast. It presumably continues with what they do as well. Absolutely. And one of the things I wanted folks to understand, you know, I've been fortunate enough in this group to meet folks like yourself at your level. And, you know, we're not talking about classes and, and rank and all that, but uh, having a much deeper appreciation for there's a different way of thinking. There is a different level of execution at, at which at, at your level that you have to drive towards completely different mindset. Um, you know, all the lazy tendencies that we have. I think you, you probably have to shrug off your, whatever natural laziness tendencies, you know, much faster <laughs> and much more often. So what would you say to professionals um, uh, who want to get to the VP level? Yeah, I want, they want the title, right? But what, is, what does it really take to <laughs> play that game? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So there's the whole notion of delivering value. That always, uh, it always starts with that. There's value that you have to be delivering in your roles. You have to be associated with delivering value and across the board, right? Uh, people will evaluate you based on that. Okay, uh, the network comes into play because if you deliver value, but you're not viewed as a team player, that, that's an issue as well. When you talk about, you know, large organizations, small organizations, right? The ability to be a team player is key. Uh, so I would highlight that, underscore that as well. Uh, it's okay to admit what you don't know, right? To, to your uh -huh. teams. I'm very comfortable with that. Yeah, and, and perhaps influenced in many ways because I made a transition from an area that I was very deep in to one that I wasn't as deep in at all. Okay. And so I, I think people, you know, it's a refreshing thing for people when, they hear, oh, wow, he asked me my opinion. He wasn't sure, right? Uh, and I try to instill that type of culture in the organizations that I build. And so interestingly, when you get associated with delivering value, being a team player, uh, being okay to not be the smartest guy in the room, in the room which is a you know, way of paraphrasing what I said a second ago, you find that there's a lot of positivity that can come out of that. Now, there's a lot of experiments that you're doing. If you're in an environment where a company is rising tremendously, maybe you can ride that wave, right? Uh, that's not the position I'm in as we continue to make investments to make a turnaround, which seems to be happening and going in the right direction based on the past three quarters. So we have to continue pedaling. And, and therefore, there's a specific metric that is being put over my head by, you know, uh, ultimately the CEO and people who report into him and my superiors that ultimately determine how well I do. So I will underscore those three things. Those are absolutely critical. You know, you, you talked about, I'll touch really quick about shrugging off certain tendencies. Uh, you know, uh, it's said that we, before we do anything, we, we have to read a newspaper and have a doubles, right? Or whatever the new expression might, might turn out to be. It was certainly relevant when I was an undergrad. And, you know, interestingly, when, I mean, I was always type A, always very uh, aggressive and passionate about what I pursued, but I was definitely reading a newspaper and eating doubles, you know, uh, in quotes before I started what I had to do. That's less so now. I mean, if it exists at all, uh, you know, I get up, Right. If I'm heading into the office, I jump in my car. I might be taking calls on the road. If I'm working from home, I do exactly what I'm doing here. Right. There's a, a yes. quick drink of tea or the tea is packed at my side and I jump right into it. There's no unwinding of for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I, I just don't have that luxury. So does that mean I'm less Trinidadian? I would argue not. <laughs> right. So having said that though there's a ton of positive stuff we bring you know in terms of uh, who we are right or we can bring uh, obviously there's an individual personality all 1.4 million of us are not 100 alike that's not the case and so bring out allow yourself to be you is, is one of the things i would say there's mm -hmm. another executive uh, uh and she's based on the west coast uh, she's from the virgin islands uh ibm -er as well and when she was interviewed uh, last summer, I believe, or last February, to be more precise, you know, she talked about allowing yourself to be yourself. Right? You know, uh, I would strongly emphasize that. Don't think that you, you need to go into that role not allowing yourself to be you. You know, there's three phrases within IBM. I belong, I matter. And, and there's a third one that's escaping me at the moment. And the idea there is to be inclusive. Right. So back to the point I made in terms of the culture at IBM allowing you to redefine, reinvent yourself. There's also this notion of inclusivity, which has been driven very strongly and increasingly, you know, with the unfortunate events of last year. 
And that allows me, in speaking to any executive, right, my accent comes out the way it's coming out now. They know I'm not from wherever. They, they can't potentially place it. Maybe they think it's Jamaican, what have you. Those who are well-traveled know otherwise and are able to specifically hone in on that. And it's fine. You know, I don't need to sound like I grew up in New York or what have you. So the fact that you bring out the accent, and I think some personal stories in my life, like just keeping your accent from home has, it's almost like a signaling mechanism, right? You're out in this big crowd and someone hears your voice and you're like, huh, where are you from? And, and that's, that's a, you talk about this organic connection and, and that's, you know, one of the quickest ways to gain an organic connection. Someone might, you know, I met people where, oh, they have family members who are from Trinidad. So we form a connection. They're not even Trinidadian. And, and that has led to certain things, even I would say to this podcast. So I, I appreciate the fact that you're calling out, just kind of be yourself, especially at your level. I think uh, even some of my preconceived notions, oh, you're going to be a VP, like, all right, CEO, you have to act and, you know, be, be straight up and, and whatnot. And I wanted to share a lesson I learned from the CEO of my company, uh, Jensen Wang. And he was like, don't, don't be a know-it-all. Like, know-it-alls don't get much done, right? And, and they're not very good. They're not fun to be around. So it's okay to just say, hey, yeah, I don't know this. And, and creating that culture of just acceptance. Like, hey, you don't know something. Okay, you're smart enough to, to figure it out. And you have enough peers where, you know, we can get it done. So um, you, you, you keep saying certain words that as I've traveled in my career, I appreciate more now. One is mentorship. Two is culture. And I think maybe at home, in the companies at home, folks don't get to experience a, a, an interesting sort of global culture, which ends up shaping sort of your view of the world. So what can, what can you say about culture and, and what, what are the elements that people should be looking out for to, to take into their own career paths? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good question, right? So and, and yeah, maybe folks who might not, maybe you're part of a, an enterprise home that is regional. And so maybe you get some sense of that as well. Uh, you know, we in, in the region, right? And in Trinidad and Tobago, there's a distinct regional culture for sure. And it permeates all industry, right? To a significant degree. In North America, in Europe, in Asia, right? Uh, the elements of those cultures are intertwined, intertwined, excuse me, with a corporate culture. Right. And I think one of the things you can do is by meeting individuals and asking questions. Right. If you whatever you are interested in doing, if a a particular company begins to appeal to you, small, medium or large advice, I also gave my my cousin fairly recently. Right. And his selection choice. Understand from the people who are there what the, the culture is like, ask those deliberate questions. Another thing you can do and you should do is pay attention to who they're having you speak to, right? There's a certain level of sensitivity or tone deafness <laughs> that a company might uh, manifest in terms of the discussions you are having. So I know of an individual, for example, she was contemplating uh, making a move uh, from one tech company to another tech company. I'll, I'll just say it like that, right? And in her experiences, and she's, you know, was uh, medium level, entry level executive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the people she spoke to were not at one point in time did she speak to a, a, a female developer or engineer or executive. Not one point in time did she speak to uh, an engineer developer of color. Now, does that mean that they had none? Probably not. Uh, but it's certainly a level of tone deafness manifested if you are trying to bring this individual into your environment. So you may say, are you going there to do that? And, you know, at the end of the day, representation always matters because unless you're making a short pit stop, like in the pits where you come, you change tires and you move on. It, this is not, you know, I like to say, you know, the, the roles we have, it's not the same as uh, an athlete making a pit stop for a year and then transferring to another club. That's not quite what it is. (laughs) Okay. Your stops tend to be a bit longer. Okay. And the ability to continue and moving on, you know, putting myself aside. Yes. You highlighted this at the beginning, right? 19 years at IBM, but have had easily six or seven careers within those 19 years. So it's almost as if I have moved across companies within a company. And so given that, umbrella think through uh, the people who they you know introduce you to speak to etc cetera, etc cetera. that matters 
Uh, and if you're not doing that, if they are not doing that, you get a good sense of what the culture is like. And if you, they are doing that, then ask those questions. And then, of course, for many of these companies, there's stuff out there in, in the press and social media. You should certainly read that with the right level of filtering. Uh, some of that may or may not be true, but you can certainly get acquainted with what their corporate citizenship looks like. I think these are important things because... Uh, certainly, as I look at myself as a parent now, maybe it was less important when I wasn't a parent, but as my boys are getting older, I want to be able to not only explain what I do, but stand behind decisions we make company-wide that affect society. To, to me, that's very significant. Okay? Right. Uh, as they begin to ingest and get more familiar with you know the, the challenges that the world faces. Culture. So it's interesting that you sort of highlight that and. I think even before you said that, I only may, maybe I've heard one other instance of pay, paying attention to that element uh, in your career. So thanks for, for calling that one out. And the other thing I wanted to get to very quickly was uh, you said delivering value, right? So you've had six, I, I believe, distinct careers in IBM. And, and I think when people think about, and this is something I'm learning at NVIDIA, right? Where the CEO basically says, uh, this is the place to do your life's work, which is a, a very loaded statement. Like one might say, oh, yeah, you just want to come work for his company for, you, for your whole life, right? And, uh, but then he says like, hey, everyone here is a volunteer, right? If, if you don't want to do it, leave, right? It's very, very clear cut. So you end up seeing people who are, they put their everything into a job. And it's very, um, I feel very fortunate to, to experience a culture like that, not necessarily Every company maybe has the financial mechanisms to, to create something like that. Um, but you highlighted delivering value. And I think, uh, can you tell us, one, there's a mindset. Uh, two, I, I think there's also maybe a scoping of opportunity. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if that maybe has come from your Caribbean background. Like you, you can meld with a bunch of different people. And you're like, oh, I'm doing physics here. I'm seeing these cloud people over here. You know, tell us, tell us maybe about, you know, how important that is to career progression? Yeah, you know, so f first of all, every, every enterprise is going to have some management process as it relates to performance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever that looks like. So many companies have done away with stack ranking, but you're still evaluated, okay? And, and that whole evaluation process is going to examine how well did you deliver what you were supposed to deliver. Now, at the end of the day, if you're in a research organization, much in the way I am, there's experimentation that you do, all of which doesn't pan out. That's obviously the case, right? Uh, however, when it comes to the evaluation, right, based on what you were supposed to do, whether that actually turns out to be tangible uh, innovation that impacts the market or not, uh, you are going to be you know, evaluated based on that. So with that in mind, you know, joining any enterprise and not paying attention to your performance metrics and what that means ultimately means you're not thinking through what your future is. And if you've gotten that far, right, with bachelor's, master's, PhD degrees, presumably that's not how you, the mindset you're taking into the role. So now progressing past that part, right, uh, there's a, a sense of technical and non-technical. Technical, obviously, if there's an approach you have to take, let's take something that's even further big, right? It has gone beyond, you know, prototyping and it's essentially, you know, in advanced development, okay? And maybe there's a product there out there already and you're continuously improving it, okay? I'll see this out there. So there's, again, metrics that are applied, applicable to that. And obviously, there's a technical approach that you take in terms of what you need to do, uh, the scrum process, you, uh, you know, you're pra practicing agility, you're getting feedback from the market, you're tweaking appropriately, etc. A lot of this, though, does fall into a non-technical category. And it spans broad teams. If you're in a dev organization, a development organization, right, uh, presumably, right, you have others you can rely on in terms of client interaction or offering interaction. The tighter that is and the more uh, effective you can be in bringing those together, the more effective you will be in delivering value. So that's the approach I've taken even when I was a, a contributor as opposed to an exec leading a large team. So now as an exec leading a large team, I ensure that I have strong partnerships with my brands who are the IBM business units, who are receiving the capabilities we build to put into their various products, right? Both, both software and services. And 
continuously working directly with clients, getting client feedback so that we can back to the beginning of the pipeline, begin to think through uh, whether or not there's a scalability challenge here, there's a usability challenge here, what have you, and think through from a design and implementation point of view, the pivots we need to make. So does our background help? It absolutely does because I, I meet people from all over the world, we might have cricket in common, football in common, food in common, you name it, right? And that, you know, that makes the conversation light from time to time. There's a, there's a fellow uh, IBM exec, uh, he, he's from India, and, and we were, I remember when we were going through this bad spell where we hadn't won a test match, I was having this discussion with him, and I said, oh, we, do we have to keep doing this? He said, yes, I'll tell you when a test match. But he was joking, <laughs> right? But it was fun. It, it made things light right? Because we were in a, a tight situation there in terms of what we were trying to do. And it, it lifted, you know, the sort of burden, so to speak, for the, for the moment. So again, that, that's why I come back to the sort of grounding, technical, non-technical. There's what you have to do technically, okay? And you should be doing that to deliver value. But don't divorce your personality non-technically in terms of, because at the end of the day, we're people. And you're trying to make a team, however big that team is, depending on the scale of the product, the you know, whether it's something new, if it's an MVP or something that's mature, what have you, you're trying to make a team successful, okay? And in a dynamic market with competition, you know, that's incredible. Uh, in a pandemic reality, there's a lot you have to think through. So bring all of you, and, and perhaps that's what, you know, your CEO means, right? In terms of volunteering, bring yourself, your whole self to, the, to that job. And it's not something, I'll be clear, it's not something that I did at the beginning. At the beginning, I, you know, obviously you knew because I, I could never, you know, hide my accent, so to speak, but yeah. I brought fully, right, the, the technical side of me, okay? And I was the individual who thought he had to be the smartest in the room, but that evolved over mm. time as I grew, as I learned, as I met others who weren't. And the last thing I'll say on accent, uh, there's a ex-IBM executive. He ran our power business for many years, IBM Power Systems. He's now an uh, executive at General Electric. I uh, also a Fatima alumnus, interestingly. Uh, the first time I heard him speak to a, a bunch of senior executives, so he left IBM uh, and was a former general manager, right? So GMs run billion-dollar businesses, just to put it in context. At mm -hmm. other companies, he would be a CEO. First time I heard him speak, I said, wow, Colin's accent is like 100% there. This is wonderful. I was a, you know, a new employee. So it gave me that comfort. Now, you wouldn't have that opportunity at every you know tech company across the board as you go across you know fang and so on right but just take note and listening to what we are discussing here that it's okay to do so it's okay to bring 100 percent of yourself yeah and you know the accent is cool especially like when you hear an executive level like oh wow that that dude got up there or, or that woman got up there and like yeah you can kind of do it and then i think that's the main mission with this podcast is to remind you and to just give you more data points, right? To remind you that it is possible wherever you kind of want to go, your path is going to wind around maybe to many different companies or like, or like yours, you innovate uh, within a company. All right. And then actually have a tremendous amount of impact. So as we transition nearer to the end, um, I think this is probably even more important for you these days. How do you sort of find work-life balance? Right. Uh, I think that's often a deciding factor of, all right, do I want that much stress? Yeah, you're making more money, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, everything has a price. But how do you sort of manage um, those things? Yeah, you know, and, and this is something I see of yourself, right? As fast as something, first thing I'll say, as fast as something gets on my plate, I get it off in an okay. efficient way, not, not mm. you know, obviously in a reckless way, right? Uh, that's one thing. Uh, I, I believe in efficiency and execution. Uh, time management is a critical part of this, if, absolutely critical part of this. So I was up quite early as an example. It's Saturday, of course, so that doesn't apply, but we are doing a, a technical podcast, work-related podcast on a Saturday, right? So there's at least four different things that I got done uh, this morning prior to this, and there's four more I'll get done after this, and then socialization and so on and so forth. I'm always at my kids' games, right? My oldest son plays tennis. My younger one plays soccer. I'm actually missing soccer practice now, but my wife <laughs> has taken him there. That's fine, right? I make sure that I'm present at their matches, at their practices, right? Uh, their school events, what have you. My wife and I, what, once a week, you know, in the week itself, Monday to Friday, we try to find a day where we may have a drink, uh, maybe have mm -hmm. a, 
uh, outside of the house, right? Uh, and that helps. Obviously, the pandemic, you know, has put a monkey wrench on many of those things. But with the state of New York currently able to resume a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, it, it comes back fundamentally to the things you're passionate about. It, it's, you know, if family is critical to you, if your network is critical to you, uh, you have to allocate time. Now, balance doesn't mean uh, it's averaged, so to speak. It's temporal, temporally averaged. It's mm -hmm. not uh, on a day basis. It, it's more like on a week to month basis. Okay. And so that's the approach I try to take, ensuring the right touch points. We have multiple of those that we can exploit uh, with, you know, with our family, friends, and so on. We just took a trip, you know, uh, which was long overdue with uh, not only our nuclear family, but my mother-in-law, my mother, right, uh, to spend time with the grandkids. So we were away for a week and a, a little bit. So I really believe in this because at, at the end of the day, we're people first, right? Uh, you know, if I had an epiphany one day and I decided to join the Peace Corps, I'm no longer at IBM, what do I have left? Yes, I have what I did at IBM and in, in the industry and technology, right? But family ultimately and, and the things that I'm passionate about. So Time management is a critical part of this, right? Uh, efficiency and execution from a work point of view is another. It does raise the question, though, uh, whether or not uh, you want to go beyond a particular level. I've gotten that question many times, hmm. right? My, my, uh, one of my physicians said to me uh, after he heard about my, my promotion, he said, you know, do, how high do you want to go? Do you see yourself as CEO? <laughs> Given that it's a public podcast, I'll leave that alone for now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, I think it really comes down to, you know, uh, are you doing what you want to do? Because when you max hmm. out a role, I don't believe it's worth it to stay in the role, right? And you should never leave a role when it's maxed out. It should be right before. Because the time you max it out, you will know. You will not have the same passion, right? You will not wake up the same way with the same level of enthusiasm to do it. And, and by the way, just to be clear, that's... That's one thing. There are other things aside, adjacent to that, that you might be doing, like driving a podcast for the region, like writing a book, like I did a few years back. So all of these bring together your whole self. Uh, I, I do believe, you know, in the notion of reevaluating what you do. And if you're in a role two to three years and you like that, you haven't maxed it out, by all means, keep pushing, right? If you're able to wake up every day and find value from it, then that's fantastic. That's all the, ultimately the fundamental question to answer. And so there is a limit, though. I do agree, right? Uh, maybe some individuals, that's becoming a CEO. For others, that's, you know, uh, not having that much time consumed. The higher you go, clearly, the more uh, or less of your time, I should say, that you would have because the responsibilities are huge. Yes. Uh, I appreciate you sort of saying, you know, are you doing what you want to do? I, I think... I recently made a team transition and it's on to, you know, the CEO's top, top priority. Right. And, and he basically said, like, if you're not waking up every day in a panic, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. You should be in a panic. But what he said was quite interesting is that um, if you don't have a strategy, uh, you won't, you won't be in a panic. If you have a strategy, you'd be in a panic because you want to execute on that strategy. And that was just kind of blew my my mind, at least on my level. And I think I I definitely take that one, you know, are you doing what you want to do? And and just jumping in and just knowing that there's a certain amount of threshold and and change in your own mentality where okay, there's more work, but it's actually your mind has to adjust to this level of work and it's it becomes the same, you know, low level of work that you're kind of accustomed to, maybe. So, uh, as we get closer, what are the three principles you you live by? You shared certain things al along the way, um, but can you summarize them? Yeah, and I I want to quickly touch on what your CEO said. It's said another way. It's embracing discomfort. I, I like how he phrased it. If you have a strategy, you should be in a state of panic because you see what's in front of you, and you're like, okay, there's a lot that I need to do to execute mm -hmm. on the strategy. So I, I can't agree more. It's a different way of stating embracing discomfort from both a personal and organizational viewpoint. And I think uh, it's what true leaders live by and ultimately uh, are able to, you know, drive value by adopting such principles. My own principles, you know, I sort of highlighted before, right? Uh, to me, you know, it comes down to really, you know, three essential things, right? There's the notion of, you know, again, being passionate about what you do. I, I really come back yes. to that. 
right? If you're not passionate about what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. You'll have difficulty waking up. You'll have difficulty doing it. Uh, find purpose, establish purpose in what you're doing, right? Uh, through that purpose, you may derive passion as well. The passion might very well be intrinsic, but then the combination is unbeatable because you found purpose, life purpose, whatever that is, okay? Uh, and you are passionate about it. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition to deliver value and to be successful at it. You have to perspire, right? And so make sure you, you know, put your shoulder to the wheel to execute. Now that's, you can apply that to all of life, but when you step back a bit, you know, ultimately that comes down to people. That comes down to the relationships you build, the relationships you nurture organically, okay? And fundamentally again because we are people just remember that where we are engineers and technologists uh, secondly not firstly firstly we're human beings so always remember uh, the value of life and how in your life through the efforts that you put out you can influence and shape others those are Great. fundamentally how i try to live both from a work-life balance point of view and generally I see you can't take the physicists out, out of Nick necessary <laughs> and sufficient conditions you know <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> we're doing a proof here today. Always, um, always. So what are two pieces of advice you'd have for a high schooler, a person in college, and, and a professional? Yeah, good question. High schooler, open mind with respect to where your future can go. Even if mm. you think you're already hell-bent on being XYZ, because you're at that phase mm -hmm. where you should be taking in a lot Okay, as you do your coursework, et cetera. And maybe, maybe, like I've seen others who have done, get an internship in that space, even at the high school level. I think it, it will help you, especially if you think you have an idea of where you want to go. Certainly for the college student. For the college student, absolutely ensure you're meeting people, you're networking organically, and you're experimenting with what role you might potentially have eventually by doing internships. Okay, I can't underscore that enough. For the professional, this is interesting, right? So for the professional, it's to me, it, it's a continuous re-evaluation of what you do, even when it's new, right? Because <laughs> that comes back to having a strategy and, and being in a state of panic because you have a strategy and embracing the discomfort that comes with being in that state of panic. That re-evaluation is key because uh, we're in a dynamic world. Uh, professionals in tech who understand that quite clearly. Of course, the pandemic has accelerated a lot of technology and, and obviously there's a goodness that comes from that specifically, uh, but the dynamism in the planet with the problems that the planet has to solve uh, that really haven't changed that much. It, you know, They've been there all along from injustice to poverty and now the rise of infectious diseases. Technology has a role to play and because a strong role to play and because of that, right? As an individual, if you have core principles that, that align to some degree with what I articulated before, that reevaluation will help you in, in navigating forward, especially when it comes to leaving something for your kids to take over and learn from, the next generation to take over and learn from. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Now you make me think about, hey, it's Saturday, I need to go reevaluate what I'm going to do uh, <laughs> next week. And, and I think that's what I've learned from speaking to a, a lot of folks, especially at your level, is just that constant reevaluation of, hey, are you doing the right thing? And, and that's very interesting that you pointed out before. Uh, you shouldn't necessarily stay in a role until you max it up because you, you end up taking out the, the passion uh, that, that you end up coming there with. And I guess that you know, affects your reputation overall, right? If, if you drop in, 100%. drop in performance. So uh, last question, what three books do you recommend? That's a good question. Are you a big reader? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, not as much as I need to be. <laughs> yeah, what three books I recommend. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> I recommend this for a different reason, not because I'm an sure. IBM, but it's a good book. Uh, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? I recommend that. What? Yeah, <laughs> Lou, Lou Gusano. Right? Okay. Uh, very, I, I had the uh, privilege of, of meeting him and, and getting that book uh, signed That's by cool. him. Yeah, very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a good leader. Well, it, it the reason I recommend it, right, from a leadership point of view, it's a good book giving you insight into uh, enterprises, market dynamics, right, okay. culture, 
all of those factors, right? So that's a good one. Uh, I recommend this one from the point of view of if my story is inspirational to you and you care to hear more, I recommend this for sure. Struggle and Progress. It's my own, <laughs> very oh, own, right, uh, book. And I'll give you a quick uh, glance here on screen. All right, all right. Uh, uh, and a uh, quick story on that. Uh, you know, the inspiration from that came from my own family in many ways, but I had friends in my network uh, advocate to publish it and you know that led to so many different things because it wasn't the intent certainly wasn't that at the beginning mm -hmm. and uh fun fact you know uh together with partnership with republic bank and a consulting company known as minnow we have these books being distributed throughout the high school system currently uh in fantastic and Tobago. so yeah I, I, I recommend it if this story appeals to you you certainly don't have to go out there if the story doesn't appeal and, yes you know, yeah cool and so once again i uh, appreciate your time I, I know the vp's time is, is incredible and to get an hour and a half of you know a vp from ibm especially if someone was in there to be like okay you need to step you need to step right uh, to grab hour and a half of my time so you know greatly appreciate you sharing your lessons and i hope you know, folks on the call pay attention and use it to chart you know a great career for themselves so Mark, I, I thank you as well. As I said before, you, you're making a significant investment also, right? And all our times are valuable, to be clear. So I appreciate your investment in making this successful. And I know together we will. And uh, proof will be in the pudding for many generations. So thank you as well. Much appreciated. All right, you have a good one. You Take too. care. Thanks a lot. Take care. Later. I hope you enjoyed today's interview and you took away some great perspectives for your own journey in machine learning and tech. The field of tech, machine learning, and AI will have a great impact on the Caribbean region, so make sure you get involved. Remember that your Caribbean heritage is a great asset for your professional career, so take advantage of it and keep working on your skills. Later.